Blessed be. Thank you the most, our God, for the life of my brother, Chief Prince Yadi Elba and Yasaskar. Praying that the Creator continue to be with him, his family, his household. Prince Jerry, I always tell the story. He the first one that actually got in a car with me and let me drive. Mm. <laughs> and that was an adventure. <laughs> he was like, don't worry about it. Just take your time. Go a little bit slow. I was, I was taking turns, and I was about ready to take everything on the block. Babies, dogs. He said, don't worry about it. <laughs> That's the right person to have you learn how to drive a car because he was laid back. I didn't see him worry. I didn't do. I didn't see him do any of that. I went one time with with Prince Poor, and I and I just moved wrong the right. He said, hey, he said he, "Get out of there! Get out of here! Let me sit down and let me drive." <laughs> but Prince Jerry was just laid back. That's how his his personality always been. He just a laid back person, always you know got a goodly word. He's a he could he could joke with the best of them. You know, um, but he's a he's always like that balance that you're not gonna be too like quick to go off. And if he's mad, if he's upset, then you know stuff you really, 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 really wronged him. He's that person. And then, you know, those are the type of people that when they really get upset and they gonna like you they get like that tunnel vision, like, you know, so um but it takes a long time, you know, for him to get to a point like that. And I um and I appreciate a brother like that, you know, coming around, you know, just like first coming around and you just, he was there when I came around. He was there, you know, and doing the work silent, not really being like, like he was always the main part, but not like the most boisterous person. And it's a blessing, man. It's a blessing to have leadership like that. People would understand and people that would sit down and actually understand you, talk to you and do the things that a leader must do. You know, a leader is not just getting up and speaking. That You're just a speaker. A lot of people could talk real good, mm -hmm. but can you do the work? A couple of years ago, he wanted to quit. Oh, I want to lay back. I want to. They was like, nah, you ain't quitting. <laughs> Brothers are like, you're not quitting. We're not letting you quit. We're not accepting your letter of resignation. <laughs> but he's, um, he's, a, he's a good brother, man, and... You know, um, you see it in his actions and in his work, not even the talk, just his action and his works. I'm grateful for this day, and I thank the Creator for the Holy Shabbat day, and I pray that the Most High God will give us understanding even on this, during this time. We're going to go to the portion of Shemini, which is found in the book of Leviticus, chapter 9. Mm -hmm. Leviticus, chapter 9. Now, this portion becomes kind of redundant for me because I do it all the time. But I'm going to try to, you know, <laughs> there's not too many new twists that you could go with this, but we're going to go there because we have to. And we go through the, through the Torah every year because it's necessary. You know, we restart the Torah every year. We go from Genesis all the way to Deuteronomy every year because we have to reiterate that the Torah is life. It never ends. Even when our lives end, the Torah still continues. And we have to acknowledge the greatness of the Torah and the understanding of the Torah that the Most High God has left here for us. So anybody out there know the meaning of the, of the word? Um, what does Shemini mean? There you go. Not you, no. Obviously you. <laughs> you ready? Yeah, you could turn on the TV. So I got a present. The same, I just a little added tweaks to it. But um, it's basically the same. Shemini, eight. Offerings, the death of Aaron, sons, and dietary laws. We're in the book of Leviticus, chapter 9, verse 1. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moshe called Aharon and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said unto them, unto Aharon, Take thee a bull calf for a sin offering 
and the ram for a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before Yehovah. So, let me just set the, what's happening at this time. Mm -hmm. So, I believe Exodus 29 speaks about the Most High God gave Moses the detail as to when Aaron and his sons will become priests officially. So what we're going through right now is actually the um, the commemoration or the the ceremony mm -hmm. of them becoming actually priests, right. sitting in the office ordained, right, as priest in the seat of priest for the nation. Mm -hmm. So this is actually what we're going through. So they went through an eight day purification period. Mm -hmm. They had to stay within the walls of the tabernacle. They couldn't come out. Mm -hmm. They had to be purified. They had to be washed. All these things had to happen in order for them to become um, equipped or be ready to become priests before the Most High God. So Aaron was commanded to take the bull calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering without blemish and offer them before Yahweh. So before he could do anything, he had to purify himself. Right. Being that he is the high priest, he had to purify himself. So this is just Aaron's offering, right? So this is what the animals will look like. Obviously, you need calves and you need um, you need lambs because if a bull gets, if you offer up a full bull, it probably wouldn't even fit mm -hmm. on the on that tabernacle. So therefore, this is a, a six month old bull calf of the first year. The red, the red one at the top, and that is a, um, and that is a a, a he goat or a, or a he lamb, right? Um, so that's in Leviticus chapter nine, verse two. Keep reading, my brother. And unto the children of Israel, thou shalt speak, saying, Take ye a he goat for a sin offering, uh -huh. and a calf and a lamb, both of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering. So for the children of Israel, a he goat, and unto the children of Israel. Thou shalt, thou shalt speak, saying, take ye a he goat for sin offering. So this is very interesting because when you read in the New Testament, what they try to refer to as um, Jesus being the, the right. sacrificial lamb, right? right? When, you, when, when you read in our Torah, even, even when, you, when, when we get to... Akare Mot, the portion Akare Mot, which is going to be the portion after next week's portion. It speaks about offerings and the Azazel, the scapegoat, mm -hmm. and the goat that we offer before the Most High God for the sins of the children of Israel. Right? It never speaks about for the sins of Israel, do you put those sins on the land? Mm -hmm. It always speaks about a goat. So therefore, we see it here, which coincides with everything that we see, we saying the he goat is for the sin offering for the nation of Israel. So when we when we hear these concepts of Christianity about, about, about Jesus being the, 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 the sacrificial lamb for the nation of Israel, as a nation, as a whole, whenever we did an offering for our sins during Yom Kippur, it was always on a goat. Not on the lamb. Two different animals, right? Although they are flock, part of the flock, but they're two different species of animals, right? One is a goat and one is a sheep. Two different species of animals, all right? So let us go. Verse 4. And an ox and a ram for peace offerings to sacrifice before Yehovah, and a meal offering mingled with oil, for today Yehovah appeareth unto you. So I was looking up that ox, right? So... What is, the, what is America's definition of an ox? Anybody knows? A male bull, but what specifically? When you, look up, when you look it up in Webster's Dictionary, what does it tell you? It's just a spe specific thing about an ox. A bull used as a draft animal. A bull wagon. A bull wagon. A cow. And also castrated. Mm. A cat, what it says? A castrated male bull. So mm. now, we just read that the Most High God wants perfect things 
mm-hmm. offered to him. So a castrated male bull is not a perfect, perfect. thing. Right. We can't offer up anything to the Most High God that's castrated. So why, are it, why is the ox there? Now, in some interpretations, you see bullock. So the only determination I could come up with is that there were different types of um, bovine animals. When I say bovine, I mean like cows, mm-hmm. bison, mm-hmm. you know, water buffaloes. We might have had like a different species of, mm-hmm. of, a, of a bull right. that we also offered up. That mm-hmm. was called a bullock. It could have been a water buffalo because they were indigenous to that area also. Mm. Besides a regular, um, a regular cow or bull, right? That was being mm. offered up. So um, an ox, that's a mistranslation. According to what we see in Webster's Dictionary as telling us what an ox is because we mm. cannot offer up to God anything that's castrated. That's impossible. We can't do that. Let us go. And they brought that which Moshe commanded before the tent of meeting, and all the congregation drew near and stood before Yehovah. Mm-hmm. And Moshe said, this is the thing which Yehovah commanded that ye should do. So it also said for the congregation that they must offer up a meal offering mingled with, with oil. So the meal offering would be, the meal offering mingled with oil would have been already something that's, this is just the ingredients, but it would have been something that's already made into a loaf. Mm. It was already something because it was something that the priest would have to eat at the end of this ceremony. So this was maybe like an unleavened um, wafer, unleavened bread. You know, we just came out of the season of, of, of unleavened bread. So it would have been something like that that they would have had to make and the congregation would have had to make to present before as an offering before the Most High God and before the priest. Right. So Aaron had two offerings that he had to make. The congregation had about three offerings that they had to make before the Most High God. Let us go. This is the thing which Yehovah commanded that he should do, that the glory of Yehovah may appear unto you. And Moshe said unto Aaron, draw near unto the altar and offer thy sin offering and thy burnt offering and make atonement for thyself and for the people. And so, pres- so Aaron had to get himself prepared before he could do anything for the people. Right. Before he came before the people, he had to get himself prepared. It should be like that in all things in life when we, especially those of us who sit in the position of teachers and and that speak to people, you need to be prepared Mm -hmm. before you come before the people. You have to try to um, get rid of certain things, certain uncleanlinesses off of you before you come before before God's people and present anything. It's important. We always speak about it, presence and presentation and how you look when you come before God's people you can't come stinky right you can't come you know raggedy Mm -hmm. you can't come a certain way you have to come decent before the most high God and present yourself in a decent manner the most high God said that when he gave the priest the high priest his clothing he made it for honor and for splendor that's right that means he looked good and when he was consecrated, a bunch of oil was poured upon him. That's right. That smelled good. That smelled good. So these people, not only did they look good, they smelled good. Yep. So when we present ourselves before the Most High God, we should not only look good, but we should also smell pleasant. That's right. Sweet savor. Not like when people, you walk past people and say, what's wrong? That person don't know about deodorant. That person don't know about soap. Mm. So these are all the things that we need to be aware of. Let us go. And present the orphan of the people and make atonement for them as Jehovah commanded. Mm -hmm. Verse 8. So Aharon drew near unto the altar and slew the calf of the sin offering, which Mm -hmm. was for himself. And the sons of Aharon presented the blood unto him. And he dipped his finger in the blood and put it upon the horns of the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar. So all these things, if we look at them today, they would look like some type of obia... You know, um, <laughs> some type of um, ritual that was going on. Santeria. This would look like that. But this is what God required of us to do these sacrifices and to offer them up upon this altar that was newly minted, that was newly built. And that's what God needed from us. Let's go. But the fat and the kidneys and the lobe of the liver of the sin offering, he made smoke upon the altar as Jehovah commanded Moshe. And so we see, the, we see the tabernacle. This is an example of a tabernacle in the wilderness. So all these things would have been right in the altar, right in front of the, the, the tent of meeting that we see right there. You see that there's like a, a, a little bull calf right there. So that would have been right there. That pre, 
these offerings would have been going up right there and it would have been smoking right there. Let us go. And the flesh and the skin were burnt with fire without the camp. Uh -huh. And he slew the burnt offering, and our own sons delivered unto him the blood. They and he dashed it the against blood. the altar round about. Very and important, because God commanded us not to drink blood, not to eat blood, and not to eat fat. That's right. This is a commandment, and we're going to see that later when we get to Leviticus chapter 11. Let us go. And they delivered the burnt offering unto him piece by piece, uh -huh. and the head. And he made them smoke upon the altar. And he washed the inwards and the legs and made them smoke upon the burnt offering on the altar. And the people's offerings was presented. And he took the goat of the sin offering, which was for the people, and slew it and offered it for sin as the first. Uh -huh. And the burnt offering was presented, and he offered it according to the ordinance. And the meal offering was presented. And he filled his hand therefrom and made it smoke upon the altar. Mm -hmm. Besides the burnt offering of the, of the morning, he slew also the ox and the ram. The sacrifice of peace offerings, which was for the people, and Aharon's sons delivered unto him the blood, and he dashed it against the altar round about. And the fat of the ox and of the ram, the fat tail and that which covereth the inwards, and the kidneys, and the lobe of the liver. And they put the fat upon the breast, and he made the fat smoke upon the altar, and made the breast and the right thigh Aharon weighed for an offering before Yahweh, as Moshe commanded. And Aharon lifted up his hand toward the people and blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering. So, so Aharon came on. Yivareka Yehovah Yishmareka Yair Yehovah Panao Leka Wikuneka Yisa Yehovah Panao Leka Weyasem Leka Shalom. May Yehovah bless thee and keep thee. May Yehovah make his face to shine upon thee, be gracious unto thee. May Yehovah lift up his countenance upon you and may he grant you peace. That's what he did after he did all of these offerings. This is what Aaron did, right? After he did all of these offerings, this is what Aaron did. He came out and he blessed his, the people. This is all part of the ceremony. You know, ceremonies are very important because ceremony shows elevation. Like, you know, they got step-up ceremonies. You go from what, pre-K to what? Kindergarten. And then you go from kindergarten to what, first grade. And then from, you go, what, five, six grades, and then you go from, Sixth grade to junior high school, or fifth grade in my time. It was fifth grade to junior high school. And then for junior high school, you know what I mean? You go from sixth, you go from eighth grade to ninth grade. Another ceremony. These are all ceremonies to show that you're stepping up. That's something you're being elevated. So this ceremony is being shown as an elevation from what you just saw as Aaron and his sons just being common and regular. Now they're being elevated to a job before the creator. And then, you know, you go from high school, you go to college, and then from, from university, college, whatever, you do four, three years, whatever it is that you do, you get your, some people do associate's degree, some people do bachelor's, right? And then you get, you get a ceremony there. And you go for your doctorate or, or your, your master's and then your doctorate. And some people just collect degrees and keep going back to school and collecting degrees, which is all good. But these are all ceremonies to show an advancement, a stepping up, that you're doing something, you're getting to a certain level. And this is what's happening right here with these men, with, with Aaron and his four sons. They're being elevated mm -hmm. to do a job before the creator. Let us go. And Moshe and Aaron went into the tent of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Mm -hmm. And the glory of Yehoah appeared unto all the people. And there came forth fire, fire from before Yehoah and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. So the fire shows approval from God. Mm -hmm. It said fire came from heaven and consumed the fat, the burnt offering. That was approval from the creator. God said, very good. You all have done very well. I'm satisfied with what you've done. And fire came from heaven and consumed what was there. Let's go. Chapter 10. Mm -hmm. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aharon, took each of them his censer and put fire therein and laid incense thereon and offered strange fire before Yehovah, which he had not commanded them. Nowhere in Exodus chapter 29 and nowhere here does it say for them to do that. Sometimes we want to do more for God than what he requires of us. And that's not what he asked for. And sometimes doing more is what offends the creator. 
It's like the same example as David when he was bringing back the cart back um the 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 um the ark of the covenant, covenant back home mm -hmm. to Jerusalem and he put it on a cart. Right. And when he put it on a cart, it said the oxen stumbled, right? And the and the, the ark of the covenant was falling, and Uziah put forth his hand. And when he put forth his hand, he died. And you will ask yourself, you said, well, why would God kill an innocent man? But ignorance of the law is no excuse. And David should have known better. So it is with the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. They should have known better because God did not require this. Mm -hmm. God didn't ask you for any extra. He just asked you for what he asked you for. And when you stand before God, you have to do that which is good and right all the time. Read on. And there came forth fire from before Yehovah and devoured them, and they died before Yehovah. So just like fire was sent down for approval, fire also was sent down from heaven for not approving of what they did or disapproval. So God could either approve of it or he could not approve it, or, or he could be not in line with what you have going on. And he will show you the same way that I approved of it and I disapprove of it. This is the God we serve. That's why I said my thoughts are not your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Neither are my ways your ways. God is different than us. The creator is different than all of us. He doesn't think the way that we think. Because we'll sit and condemn somebody forever. Prince Zerio just said, we'll sit and condemn someone forever. And God has already forgiven that person, but you still haven't gotten over your own self. Think about that. Person has moved on in their lives, have done that which is good and right, and you're still holding on to the same stuff from 15 years ago. That's why God don't think like how he, that's why he gives us an opportunity to repent. Mm. That's why he gives us an opportunity to look at ourselves and to grow. You can't look at someone that you knew when they was snotty nose and they used to eat their boogers and all that. You know, kids eat boogers and all that stuff. They eat their own boogers and lick their own snot and do nasty stuff like that. And that person is 40, year, 40 years old and you be like, you remember when you used to eat your boogers and you used to lick your snot? You think that person really going to like that for you to keep bringing that up? It's like Joe Pesci in, what was it, Casino? In the, uh, one of those movies. And he said, hey, um, you remember when you used to get your shoes? You used to shine my shoes? Good fellas. You used to shine my shoes? <laughs> he said, yeah, he said, I don't shine shoes no more. And then the guy was like, I really say. Siri, nobody was talking to you, Siri. <laughs> I wasn't talking to you, Siri. Siri, dangerous. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, um, so he was like, "Yeah, you." Um, so the guy got disrespectful. He said, "He said, why don't you come over here and shine my shoes right now?" He said something like that. So yeah. and that enraged him, and he lost his life in the movie. No, so you can't. We can't judge people for what they've done years ago. You know, and, and look at them just that same way. I'm not the same kid that I was when I was 13 and 15 or even when I was 20. I'm a 47-year-old grown man. You can't treat me the same way that you treated me when I was 15 and 14. You know, because I'm a different person than when I was 13 and 14. Right? So these are different little things that you have to see and life and improvements and the improvements that people have made and you keep looking at people a certain way and you're not respecting people. You have to respect people. If people show you respect, show respect. If people show you love, show them love. You're the one still holding on to the stuff from 15 years ago, 20 years ago. The person has made a change. We just, we... That's, that's how we program sometimes. But we have to fight that feeling. We have to fight that emotion of wanting to look down upon people and think about the, the wrong that people did all the time. And you see the, peop the person is 
constantly improving, but that's what you bring up. You bring that up. Remember that time? Remember when you used to do so and so and so? That's not funny no more anymore. Person trying to forget that. Those are the things that makes us better, that make us better people. If we could get past those obstacles and those situations, we'll be much better people on this earth. Yeah, you got to give people a chance to grow. And you have to grow in your understanding and in your thoughts. Let us go. Verse 3. Then Moshe said unto Aharon, This is it that Jehovah spoke, saying, Through them that are nigh unto me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. Mm -hmm. And Aharon held his peace. You hear that? It says, Then Moses said to Aaron, This is it that Jehovah has uh, spoke, saying, through them that are nigh unto me, uh -huh. I will be sanctified. So those of us who are close to God, we have a responsibility to how we present ourselves before God and what we do before him and the people. Because the creator will get you. Yep. People think they get, listen, people think they get away all the time. You ever wonder sometimes, you ever wonder sometimes, how an 83-year-old man got caught in a crossfire? Oh, an 84-year-old man got hit by a bus? And you said, well, that, oh, 85-year-old oh, 84, man gets bust over the head in the train? And you said, well, what did he do to deserve that? Because you said that was an innocent old man. That's what we say. But God never forgets. That's right. That 84-year-old man was once a 25-year-old looking like a buck. Mm -hmm. And he was and he was sleeping with everybody's wife. They said, my, my, my family always said, you go to the most extreme points. You always go to the most extreme stuff. Why you gotta go that deep? I said, because it's sometimes that deep. Because sometimes we think we forget. You think we forget, but God never forgets. Say, so you be too extreme with some of your thoughts and your ideas. But what else can you say when an 84-year-old man gets busted over his head or get caught in a crossfire? What else can you say? All you could do is say, God is great. We don't want to think it. We don't want to think, but God never forgets. He said, he said, uh, he said, he said, it's like, he said, he said, yesterday is like a drop of, 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 of water in a bucket. Mm. It's like a, it's like a grain of sand on the seashore. It says, yes, he don't forget. A thousand years to him, it says yesterday. He never forgets. So he has time. Time is on his side. Mm -hmm. Time, we run out of time. God don't run out of time. Now, I'm not saying that you could have done certain things in ignorance and you repented, right? But in your repenting, you have to uphold that repentance. You can't go back to that wrong like a, like a dog going back to his vomit, right. which is nasty. So you've done wrong. Some of us weren't born in this way of life. Some of us didn't have the understanding of Torah. We've done wrong things. We didn't always have this understanding. Go to God. Confess your sins to the creator. And then continue in good and in righteousness. Because he's a forgiving God. So I'm not telling you that there's not an out. But what I'm telling you is you better be very careful with the creator. Because there's certain things that he does not tolerate. He does not tolerate. But we know that he's a forgiving God. Let us go. And Moshe called Mishael and El Safan, the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aharon, and said unto them, Draw near and carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they drew near and carried them in their tunics out of the camp, as Moshe had said. So Moshe called his cousins and said, Come and pick up your, your second cousins out of, out of here. You know, because we obviously see what's going on. Moses is business as usual. This is, these are his nephews. But it's business as usual because the greater course is the creator. And the show must go on. 
We got time to mourn, but we have to continue with what is it that God left for you to do and for us to finish out. Let us go. And Moshe said unto Aharon and unto Eleazar and unto Itamar his sons, let not the hair of your heads go loose, uh -huh. neither rend your clothes that ye die not, mm -hmm. and that he be not wroth with all the congregation, but let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, be well to burn in which Jehovah have kindled. Mm -hmm. And ye shall not go out from the door of the tent of meeting, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of Jehovah is upon you. And they did according to the word of God. Because they had to stay in there for eight days. Mm -hmm. He could not leave out. They could not leave out. He could not leave that place. He had to stay there for eight days. So he said, don't take your turbans off. Don't rip your garments, which is a sign of mourning. He said, let the people do that. Finish the job. Finish the job. It's like a soldier when he's at war. And the comrades fall to the left and to the right. You don't have time to mourn. Right. Because bullets are still flying. That's right. So you got to keep ducking. You got to stay in the trenches. You pull them bodies back and you continue with the mission. This is what Moses is telling them. Moses is saying the mission must continue because God already showed his disapproval for not doing that which he commanded. You went other than. So therefore, God has judged. Yehovah has judged. And this is what's happening. Let us go. Verse 8. And Yehovah spoke unto Aharon, saying, Drink no wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tent of meat, and that ye die not. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generation. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generation. Yep. And this is something that we're very careful with. Yep. That we that we try to be very careful with. If you know you had a drink, and it doesn't tell you why they got killed, but we right. assume that they had a little bit too much to drink. Uh -huh. And they went into that, into that sanctuary, right. into that holy place where the table of incense was and put up something that God didn't ask for. So therefore now Moses is telling them and said listen, when you come before God, make sure you got everything working properly. Make sure you're not high. Make sure you're not drinking. Yeah. They tell you, they said a drink, what, what is it that the police said that, that a, and then um, and then it Throws off your, your balance, your equilibrium. Yeah, you, you take a drink or two. Me, all it takes is one drink. Mm -hmm. One drink, because I'm not a drinker. You give me two, I'm in happy, happy land. You give me three, I might be stumbling out the place. But I don't drink. You know, you got people that got high. You said, but you a big guy. You should be able, yeah, but I'm not a drinker. They got people that could really drink, could take two, three drinks, and they all right. That's just starting the party, two, two, two three drinks. It's getting started. Yeah, they just getting started. It's just like a warm-up, like they stretching. For me, <laughs> two, three drinks is I've already played the whole nine innings. <laughs> I played the whole football game. I'm done. You know, but that's a different story. But what he's trying to emphasize here is when you come before me, come with your full faculties. Don't come before, like I said at the beginning, don't come before the creator raggedy. Right. So when we stand up here, even if we have festivals and feast time, we always get the brother that has not taken a drink. You pray before God. That's right. That's important. You know why? Because you're showing the creator respect. Because you get up here, you start praying and you start slurring your speech and you start saying things that you're not supposed to be saying and your prayer doesn't even sound proper. So therefore... Get the person that's clear-minded to pray, even if it's a child. Let the child pray rather than anyone that's even taking one drink. That's right. Respect God. That's right. Respect his, his, his place of worship. Mm -hmm. Respect um, the things that he's left here on record for. Respect all of that. Mm -hmm. Now, God didn't tell us. He didn't tell us we can't have a drink. He didn't tell us, but he said, when you come before me, Make sure, as priests, that your, fac your faculties are straight and your equilibrium is straight and that you're not staggering and that you're not slurring your speech. You're not doing any of those things. God is great. Yeah. Let us go. And that you may put a difference between the holy 
and the common. Uh -huh. And between the unclean and the clean. You put a difference between the holy and the common. Right. Not saying that the common is wrong, but there's a difference between holy and common. That's the, that's the, the difference right there. And the clean and the unclean. And that's another thing. We come before God, we strive to be clean. I'm calling love you used to have this rule that, you know, when you, when you go and you present yourself before God on Friday before the sun go down, that you wash up yeah, yeah. so that you'll be clean yeah. by the time, even if you sat on the train and you might have sat behind a woman that was neater. You don't know she was neater, yeah. but she or unclean or a menstrual cycle for those who might not understand what neater is because that makes you unclean, sitting behind a woman that has seen her menstrual cycle. She, she didn't leave any blood there, but just the seat is unclean. So when you go home before the sun go down on Friday, take a shower. Mm -hmm. That's what he said, take a shower. And then when you come in on the train on Shabbat, try to stand up. So when you appear before God, and they say, Nikra et, Adon, so and so and so, you could say, Ani po Baruch Hashem, Shel Yehoah. There was a lot of times that brother said, Lord, <laughs> I can't come up. They didn't catch that shower. They didn't do certain, they sat down on the train. They did certain things. So there was a, with him, there was a sense of holiness. Present yourself as holy as you come before the most high God. Come as clean as you could be. We understand that we live on grave sites. Mm -hmm. We understand that the places that we go to and we frequent to, people have died and we might have the uncleanness of, of the dead, but the effort was put forth right. to be some sort of clean and not just disregard the matter of coming clean before the creator. He didn't used to shake your hand. Mm -hmm. He used to bow down on the Shabbat day, you bow. I know one of my teachers used to do that. Chief Elazar, you want to shake your hands on the Shabbat. Mm. May the Most High God bless both of their memories. Or he would have gloves on. He, would, he was extreme, so he would have gloves on. <laughs> and he, he would shake, he would just give you a claw. He didn't want to do all that hugging and none of that stuff on the Shabbat day. At, at some point, he wouldn't even shake your hand. Right. So we got to come before God clean. When we present ourselves before the creator, we have to be spiritual clean, physically clean, mm -hmm. mentally clean. Mm -hmm. Let us go. And that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which Jehovah has spoken unto them by the hand of Moshe. By the hand of Moshe. Let's go. And Moshe spoke unto Aharon and unto Eleazar and unto Itamar, his sons that were left. Take the meal offering that remaineth of the orphans of Jehovah made by fire. And eat it without leaven beside the altar, for it is most holy. For it is most holy. Listen, the show must go on. Mm -hmm. Moses, some writers said Moses is callous. His nephews just died. His brother's mourning. He's talking about continue. Why isn't he crying? Why isn't he mourning? Moses understood what the Most High God had put forward. And Moses didn't want anyone else to die. Moses was more so scared than anything else. Because mm. something went wrong in the, formu in, the, in the formula. Something went wrong. Right. So Moses is like recalibrating and hold on, hold on. Make sure you're still eating. You know, that. Make sure that this is still going up and smoking. And Moses is, I mean, the man wasn't worried. The man was worried. He had, he had to bear the, the, the load of the whole nation. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? Most of us would lose our minds. Yeah. And we had to go through what um, the prophet Moses went through. Yeah. That you have to shoulder the responsibility of the whole nation. That's why when his father-in-law saw him, he said, you take too much on yourself. Right. You're doing too much. You're going to kill yourself at this rate. Right. Right. So you need to get men that are honorable, that are qualified, and let them take on some of this responsibility, Moses. You're going to kill yourself at this rate. And eventually the people got to him. Eventually, the people got to him. His reaction was because of the people. So you can't, another point is you can't let the people drive you crazy. Mm -hmm. You can't let them drive you to the point of no return, which happened to Moses. Let us go. And you shall eat it in the holy place, 
because it is thy due and thy son's due of the orphans of your whole made by fire, mm -hmm. for so I am commanded. Uh -huh. And the breast of waving and the thigh of heaving shall ye eat in a clean place, thou and thy sons and thy daughters with thee. But they are given as thy due and as thy sons do out of the sacrifices of the peace offerings of the children of Israel. Children of Israel. The thigh of heaving. And the breast of waving shall mm -hmm. they bring with the orphans of the fat made by fire to wave it for a wave orphan before Yehoah. And it shall be thine and thy sons with thee as it do forever as Yehoah have commanded. Forever as Yehoah commanded. Let's go. And Moshe did diligently inquired for the goat of the sin offering. And behold, it was burnt. And he was angry with Eleazar and with Itamar, the sons of Aaron that were left, saying, Wherefore have ye not eaten the sin offering in the place of the sanctuary, seeing it is most holy? And he have given it you to bear the iniquity of the congregation to make atonement for them before Yehovah. So Moses says, look, the sin offering wasn't eaten. Right. Why wasn't it eaten? You just see what happened to your brothers. What's going on? Now Moses is angry with them, but he's really talking to Aaron. But it's still, although Moses was in the position as the prophet of the Most High, the servant of the, of the Most High, Aaron was still older. He still had love and respect for his brother. So you're not going to talk to Aaron reckless, but he, right. I could talk to my to my nephews a little bit stern and 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 ask them what's going on here. Yeah. But let's see how Aaron answers this. Behold, the blood of it was not brought into the sanctuary there within. He should certainly have eaten it in the sanctuary as I commanded. Uh -huh. And Aharon spoke unto Moshe. Behold, this day have they offered their offering. Uh huh. They offered their offering. They, they offer sin offerings. Let's go. And they burnt offering before Yehovah. And they burnt offering before Yehovah. And there have befallen me such things as these. He said, and we did all that, and my sons died. We keep going. And if I had eaten the sin offering today, would I have been well pleasing in the sight of Yehovah? said, Moses, I don't got no appetite. Right, right. When somebody dies, people go, people, the body is amazing, you know. Body could go without food for a long time. And if you're in a situation of stress, it's stress. My sons just died. You think we're really hungry? My son, their brothers just died. Mm. You really think that, like, we, we're really hungry right now? And what they did was appropriate. If you don't eat it, the offerings, if you don't eat it, some can't stay till the next morning. Right. Some can't stay. Some could only last for two days. That's right. But after that, you have to burn it. Right. You cannot. You cannot just give it to the dogs. Right. You can't give the bones to the no. That's right. not how the offerings before the Most High God go. You have to burn them. So they just burnt it completely because they weren't hungry. They were mourning. They weren't mourning outwardly, but they were mourning. Let's go. And when Moshe heard that, it was well pleasing in his sight. And it was well pleasing in his sight. Chapter 11, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now we get into the dietary laws of the Most High God. This is the last chapter of this um, actual um, portion. Let's go. And Jehovah spoke unto Moshe and to Aharon, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the living things which ye may eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Now the Tanakh is not the Torah. Some things are not in chronological order. So you're going to see, like, it just goes extreme from these guys dying to now we're talking about foods that we can't eat, that we cannot eat. And then when this portion is done, we're going to go back to the follow-up of, of what just happened here in these right. last two chapters. So um, let us go. Whatsoever part of the hoof and is holy, holy cloven-footed and cheweth the cud among the beasts, these may ye eat. All right, so now we got... So Chief Michael should be used to all these names after all these years of me giving him the same chart. So to the I'ma let him just go and he knows what we talk what what we um what we gonna get into. Let's go. Cloven footed animals have a complete split in their hood. Right. These hooves are called claws and are named for their relative location on the foot. So the cloven foot is what you see at the top, is the is the deer's hoofs right there, right? And then you got the split, complete split hoof. And then you got the cloven, which the read on is going to be. The outer or lateral claw or the inner or medial claw. All right, so the inner or the medial claw is what you, the two little black claws that you see at the top of the, of the paw right here. Let's go. The primary. Well, not the paw. That's not a paw. That's a hoof. Let's go. The primary difference between the ruminant and non-ruminant called monogastric, such as humans, dogs, and pigs. 
mm-hmm. is that ruminants have a four compartment stomach. The four parts of the stomach are the rumen, the reticulum, and the omasum. So, chewing the cud does not just mean to chew grass, to eat grass. Right? Because right? dogs eat grass. When they get sick, they'll go chew and eat up grass. And as certain animals eat grass, like, like rhinos eat grass. You know, all these animals, they eat grass. Um, camels. But what an uh, uh, animal that chews the cud is an animal that has a four-section stomach. You see the cow right there in the middle? And then you see the stomach at the bottom? These are the different sections of the stomach that a process that they go through because they don't have the, how, what, what do we have in our stomach, the vial or the gastric? Um, yeah, that, the acids in our stomach. So they have to do, they got to go through a lot more work. They have to, their saliva kind of breaks down the, the grass and the grain or whatever it is that they're eating. So they chew, it goes down to one stomach, they regurgitate it, comes back up, they chew that again, goes back to another section of the stomach, regurgitate it, and this process goes all the way through until it goes out and boom, they poop it out. All right? So this is the, um, the animals that chew the cud. Let us go. In the first two chambers, the rumen and the reticulum, the food is mixed with saliva and separates into layers of solid and liquid material. Solids come together to form the cud or bolus. Right, so it comes up like a ball, like filled with saliva, and then they um, swallow it back again. Let's go. The cut is then regurgitated and chewed to completely mix it with saliva and to break down the particle size. Mm -hmm. Fiber, especially cellulose and hemicellulose, is primarily broken down in these chambers by microbes, mostly bacteria as well as some protozoa, fungi, and yeast into the three volatile fatty acids, BFAs, acidic acid, propionic acid, and butyric acid. Mm -hmm. Protein and non-structural carbohydrate Pectin, sugars, and starches are also fermented. Also fermented. Let's go. Even though the rumen and the reticulum have different names, they present, represent the same functional, functional space, space. Uh-huh. as digester, can move back and forth between them. Mm-hmm. Together, these chambers are called the reticu- reticular rumen. The degraded digester, which is now in the lower liquid part of the reticular rumen, then passes into the next chamber, the omasum, where water and many of the inor- inorganic material, min- mineral elements are absorbed into the bloodstream. Into the bloodstream, because, you know, they need water also. They need certain nutrients. And all these stomachs and all these different functions, they, they serve their purpose. God made them perfect just like he made us perfect. For them to work a certain way. Let us go. After this, the digesters move to the true stomach, the abomasum. The abomasum is the direct equivalent of the monogastric stomach. For like example. our stomach. We are monogastric. Um, just like... like um, Pigs are monogastric. Dogs are monogastric. Let's go. And digester is digested in here, here in much the same way. Digester is finally moved into the small intestine where the digestion and absorption of nutrients occur. Right. Microbes produced in the reticular rumen are also digested in the small intestine. Mm-hmm. Fermentation continues in the large intestine in the same way as in the reticular rumen. There you go. So now we go to the... So surprisingly, giraffes are clean animals. Mm. And you see right there, he's chewing. And then, hold on, press play on that again. So you can see that he chewed a cut as he's oh, bringing, as he's bringing the, um, the boulders back up. Just look at his neck. Look at his neck. Start chewing again, so that's the process of chewing the cud. Mm. It came down from the first stomach, boom, and it went back down, down again. So giraffes, surprisingly, are clean animals for us to eat. I don't know who's hunting a giraffe right now, to who, or who's ever eating giraffe meat, but I don't think I want to eat a giraffe. <laughs> but I guess if you had to survive, you're gonna do what you have to do. That's a fact. Giraffes surprisingly chew the cud, and their hoofs are split. That makes the giraffe a clean animal for us to eat. Uh, what do we have here next? Go to the next one. It's all right. Read that. All animals under artodactyl subord or ruminacea chew cud and have split or clo- cloven hooves. Uh-huh. Families, Antilocrapidae, Bovidae, Cervidae, Giraffidae, Moscidae, and Tragulidae are all under this suborder and contains animals that chew cud. 
There are well over 250 different types of animals around the world that are clean for us to eat. So you see water buffaloes, you see what you see up there, you see deers up there, you see um, you see sheep, you see goats, you see cows, bison, um, and a bunch of other animals in the world, impalas. Bunch on the every continent has their own version of some animal that we might look in America a certain way, right? So they have them in the world. So the Most High God made this for everyone, mm -hmm. that everybody will be able to enjoy um, animals that are clean for us to eat, right. and every continent in the world, right? Maybe not in Antarctica. I don't know how much, well, how much lives up there, but in terms of animals that could survive in, in these maybe other um, continents, we have a little bit of them in all the other continents. So this is just an example of some of them. All right. Verse 4. Uh -huh. Nevertheless, these shall ye not eat of them that only chew the cud, or of them that only part the hoof, the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but part if not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. Uh -huh. And a rock badger, because he cheweth the cud, but part if not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the hare, because she cheweth the cud, but part of not the hoof, she is unclean unto you. And the swine, because he part of the hoof and is cloven footed, but cheweth not the cud, he is unclean unto uh -huh. you. Of their flesh shall ye not eat, and their carcasses ye shall not touch. So they are unclean unto you. The camel. People eat camel humps, and people eat camels. Like in the certain parts of the east, they eat camels. Mm -hmm. I've seen them actually um, flay a camel and put the whole like thing on a whole grill. They eat camels. But picture of a camel's hooves. Hey, can you use picture of a camel's hooves? As we can see. They are not there. completely split and he is not cloven footed. So the hyrax is what they what they mention here is the rock badger. Mm -hmm. What does it say about now, the hyrax? The hyrax does not chew the cut, but their chewing motion gives the appearance that it does. It gives the appearance. I think that might be a video also. Go yeah. over the picture, go back. Go, just take the, um, the arrow over the picture. That mm -hmm. might be a video, I think. I don't think so. No, pause. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the hair? The hair and or the rabbit also does not chew the cud, but their chewing motion also gives the appearance that it does. Yeah, so they don't chew the cud. So people eat rabbits. The people walk around with, with rabbits, foots, is good luck. Actually, All that's unclean. It was a, it was a video. It was a video? Mm -hmm. So you see the hyrax right there? So they chew in motion, give you the idea that, that they, yeah, like, like they are, um, yeah, like they are, um, they chew the cud, but they don't chew the cud. They are unclean animals. So all of these animals are unclean. Go to the next one. And the swine. The pig has a completely split hook. And it's also cloven footed. Yeah, for those of you before you came into this way of life and you ate pig feet, you know he got a complete split hoof. You know he pig foot. That pickle pig <laughs> pickle pig feet was. <laughs> no, y'all enjoyed that pickle pig feet, you know. So, but the pig has what? The pig has split hoof and it's also cloven footed. Uh huh. But the pig has a monogastric digestive system like humans. It does not chew the cud, cud, so it is unclean for us to consume. It is unclean for us to consume. Today, the 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 pig or the the, the swine as is mentioned in the Tanakh is the must sold meat in the market. You can find every part of it. Pork chops, <laughs> pig feet, pig tail, ham hock. Fat back, that, bacon, um, hog head cheese, um, pigtail. They sell everything. A teacher used to say if they could have bottled the oink and sold that, they would have sold that to you too. But this is the stuff that is going directly against the laws of the creator. That's right. People... I remember I used to live in a building, man, and I knew when they was making them pig entrails. Yeah. Because yeah. you walk in there, because remember, he the pig eats anything. Anything. I I somebody was telling me about a um it was a mafia um 
a hitman. It was a, it was a mafia hitman. He said he used to starve the pigs for like three to four. Somebody was telling me this. Three to five days, then he used to let them eat nothing. And when they did a hit, they would kill the person or the, pe or the, per or the people and take the bodies to the pig farm and put it in the slop, yeah. and the pig will clean them out completely, yeah. bones and everything. Yeah. The pig will eat you if you sit in there long enough. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Right now in Texas, they're having a problem with feral pigs. You know that? With feral hogs. Because what happens is, you see how he looks all pretty in pink hair? <laughs> He looks all pretty and pink here. That's because he's domesticated. But he, that same one right there will escape and go into, into the wild, and then he becomes feral. And he becomes wild. Mm. And he'll go into your farm, eat everything up. He'll grow his long tusk. Mm. He'll grow his tusk, and now he becomes a wild pig. He even becomes dark, mm -hmm. black. Mm. They adapt. So the pig is what, in ancient days, they used to use to go into the fields and clear them out. Right, they will go in there as the sanitation department. Right. That's what hotels in Vegas, the food that's left over, whatever it may be, they throw it in these big dumpster trucks. Whatever it is, lobster, whatever. And they, they take them to pig farms, and they back the trucks in there, and they just let it into the slop. And the pigs come in there and clean it out. No food wasted. No food wasted. So whatever they eat becomes part of them, and then it becomes part of us. Because they have no real filtration system. They got a monogastric um, digestive. digestive system, which entails it makes whatever it is that they eat becomes part of them, and that's what they are. You know what I mean? But that's what we eat. People eat pig ears. They eat every part of the pig. Disgusting, but let us go. Verse 9. These may ye eat of all that are in the waters. Uh -huh. Whatsoever have fins and scales in the waters, in the seas and in the rivers, these them may ye eat. And all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers, of all that swarm in the water, and of all the living creatures that are in the waters, they are a detestable thing unto you. And they shall be a detestable thing unto you. Ye shall not eat of their flesh, and their carcasses ye shall have in detestation. Whatsoever have no fins nor scales in the waters, that is a detestable thing unto Whatsoever you. Whatsoever have no fins and scales in the water, it should be detestable to you. We have to be careful when we go to fish markets and what is it that we ask for when we, when we are buying fish, right? Mm. So only fish, it's an easy thing. You go to the fish market and you say, does that fish have fins and scales? Mm -hmm. Oh, it does? Okay, let me get that. That's clean for you to eat. Clean. The fins is the little little um, wing little things that you see around the fish on the top of his, of his body, all the way down his back, the tail, all the way at the bottom. Those are the fins. And on the side of his head right here, that's the fin, right? That's what helps him to swim, right, and the movement of his body. But he, the fish has to have that, and it has to have scales. So now there was always a controversy with tuna, which is not really a controversy. And in fact, I just finished talking to a, to a fisherman um, about a month and a half ago. I was driving in the, in the truck with an actual fisherman that goes out into the sea and fish. And I asked him about tuna. Mm -hmm. And he told me about the Atlantic tuna. I said, so does tuna have scales? And he said, Every tuna, any tuna that I've ever caught never had scales. Mm. Never. He said, I don't know where they get this thing about them having scales. I've heard that, you know, they go through a nervous breakdown and they drop their scales before they come, come out of the water. But then how will you know if they have scales if they come out of the water without scales? Right. So the Most High God said, whatever we take out of there has to have what? And, and you physically have to be able to do what? Remove the scales. So for us, tuna is out. Tuna in the can, unless you could go to a supermarket and they tell you that's tuna and you could scrape it off. Sardines is out because sardines is just any small fish. Mm. We, don't know, we, we don't know if that fish has fins and scales. We have to be careful with what we put in our bodies. Now this is 
a list of that of the fish that we can have, mm -hmm. right? And there's probably much more fish, but we have. I can't see the what. What's the names? The first one is an Atlantic salmon. Atlantic salmon. Blue, I love salmon. Bluefish. Bluefish. Bass. Bass. Uh, Yellowtail flounder. Uh huh. Cow. Cod. Sika. Cod. Okay. Trout. Trout. Barracuda. Barracuda. Perch. Perch. Corgi. Corgi. Tilapia. Tilapia. And the Pacific hake or hake whiting. Whiting. Those are some, just a few of some of the fish we can have. Now, y'all might have many more names, but I'm just giving you a, a basic list, all right? So, go ahead. Verse 13. Mm -hmm. And these ye shall have in detestation among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. They are detestable things. The great vulture and the bearded vulture right, and the so osprey. Mm -hmm. We got the, the gift farm vulture, which is the great vulture. It's found throughout a large portion of the old world, inhabiting warmer portions of this hemisphere, particularly around the Mediterranean areas. It is considerably a large bird, being little short of five feet in tall length, and the wingspan wow. measuring about eight feet. You know, with five feet and what? Length. And length. Goodness, that's a big bird. And and oh, and he was and he was around the Mediterranean, which is around our region. Right. Right. So the next one is the the bearded, the bearded vulture. vulture. Uh huh. The bearded vulture, also known as the lammergeier or the lammergeier or ossifrage, is uh -huh. a bird of prey and the only member of the genus Gypetes. The bearded vulture is the only known vertebrate whose diet consists almost exclusively of bone. Of bones. Whew. They don't even want <laughs> the rotting flesh. They just want the that. You know how strong his beak gotta be. To break bones? Mm -hmm. So 70 to 90 percent of their diet consists of just after, after the hyenas finish, yeah, uh -huh. after, after the lion, the hyenas, and even the other vultures come and clean the bones clean. Yeah. Oh, we'll come in and we'll yeah. snack on the bones. These animals were created for that. Yeah. These animals were created to clean, clean the earth. earth. That's right. But what we're doing as human beings is because of climate change, of the environmental um, things that we're changing within the environment that we're causing a lot of these animals to go into extinction. And now we have problems like in Texas where you have a bunch of um, feral pigs running around and he has no natural predator. Mm. Because when the mountain lion used to be the predator to keep certain things under control, now because you're taking more and more and more territory these animals are getting moved further and further and further away to the point of extinction. So they don't, you don't have a natural predator for this actual um, pigs that are multiplying because they have litters. They have 10 at a time. Mm -hmm. We have imbalanced the earth. We have caused the, the earth to come into an imbalance and now we have a lot of problems in our hands, right? So we have overpopulated, in Jersey alone, you got a bunch of deers. Staten Island, wild, um, wild turkeys. Wild turkey. And you can't hunt them. In Staten Island, you got a bunch of wild turkeys that just, well, you see them, they come out and they take over. And you cannot hunt them in Staten Island. You touch one of those turkeys and see where you go. You're going to be at the bottom of the jail. Yeah. Am I right? In Staten Island, a bunch of wild turkeys. I used to go out there. Yeah. From Jersey, yup. And now they're populating in, in, in and and take them back to the wild. Mm. And people can't hunt them. At least in Jersey, they got a hunt season. Jersey, they got a certain time of the year where you can hunt. And even at one point in Jersey, the black bear population became too big, and they allowed people to just cut them, cut it down. But the deer is outgrowing the the black bear, which the, the bear will hunt the deer, but if you're controlling one, it's in balance. It's not no balance. Mm -hmm. So therefore, like the natural predators that will really go out there, like like um the coyotes and the the wolves and stuff, they've been these these species of animals, they disappeared from the East Coast. You don't have them. Because people have moved in, gotten into territory, hunted them, 
killed them out, so now you have an imbalance in the ecosystem, so you don't have the balance that you need to control certain animals. And theirs cost a lot of damage. Let them hit your car. They take lives. They do. You hit two, Ema. <laughs> They tore your car up, right? They, they cause a lot of damage. They cause a lot of damage, you know? So, you know, these are all the things that we have to be aware of. Let's go. And the osprey. Uh-huh. The osprey, or more specifically, the western osprey, also called sea hawk, river hawk, and fish hawk, is a diurnal fish-eating bird of prey with a cosmopolitan range. It is, it is a large raptor, reaching more than 24 inches in the length and 71 inches across the wings. It is ground on the upper parts and predominantly grayish on the head and under parts. Seahawk, that was the name of my, the mascot of my um, high school team. Parkwest Seahawks. Mm. But that's another story for another day. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> but that was, um, he's a raptor, or he's a bird of prey. Mm. So he doesn't eat carrion like rotted flesh. He hunts, right? He, he hunts his, his, his prey. Alive, and he right. kills it himself. Kills it, yeah. Right, he kills it. So he's a raptor. Let's go. And the kite uh -huh. is the common name for certain birds of prey in the family Asipridae, particularly in subfamilies Milvinae, Elianae, and Perninae. So all these birds of prey are almost like all the same, but you got some smaller, bigger. You know, they're almost like from the same family. Go. Variation, Variation yes. Falcons are birds of prey in the genus Falco, which includes about 40 species. Uh -huh. Falcons are widely distributed on all continents of the world except Antarctica, though closely related raptors did occur there so, in the AEO. So a falcon is smaller than a hawk, an eagle, but, you know, they, they, they will hunt rats and, you know, little things like that, um, mice, you know, the prey that they could go with, right? Now a hawk will go into the water and grab a, a fish, a hawk. That's his vision is so good. You know, he'll, he'll hunt rabbits. Um, if it comes to it, I mean, hawks, wherever there are hawks, you won't see too many squirrels. Mm. They'll hunt the squirrels down. Yeah. Wherever they, you, all you need is about two or three hawks in, in a certain area. You won't see too many squirrels. You won't see rabbits because they're going to hunt them down. Right? Now, eagle... Small dogs either. <laughs> yes, if you leave your small dog in the backyard, you could forget about Fluffy. Fluffy might not make it through the night. You might see Fluffy's, um, you might see his, <laughs> yeah, his fur and stuff like that, but you won't see Fluffy anymore. True story, they brought hawks to, um, to Prospect Park to, to clean up the rodent problem that they had. They had a lot of rats. The, rat, the, the hawks did their job. But then after they did their job, they still need food. Mm -hmm. So next is the squirrels. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, the folks that like letting their little toy dogs run around, got them too. You know, and, and the hawk is the pigeons. They'll hunt pigeons. Yeah, hawks, red-tailed hawk in the northeastern region of, of the United States, he's an he's a, he's a excellent hunter. Mm. He's an excellent predator. Let's go. Every raven after its kind. Uh-huh. A boy. raven is one of several large body, ser larger body series of the genus Corvus. These species do not form a single taxonomic group with the genus. Mm -hmm. There is no consistent distinction between crows and ravens, uh -huh. and these appellations have been assigned to different species chiefly on the basis of their size, Crows generally being smaller than ravens. Right, so crows and ravens are basically the same, but one is bigger than the other. One is just a little bit bigger than the other, just like a dove and a pigeon. Mm -hmm. When you look at doves and pigeons, they're the, a, the same bird. You got dove pigeons and you got um, turtle, turtle doves. Right. You got turtle dove is smaller. You got the pigeon and then you got the dove. The dove is being the biggest, but when you look at them, there's no distinct difference. Just the they stripings, they coloring, and how they look. Right. And the ostrich and the night hawk and the sea mule and the hawk after its kind. Uh huh. The yeah. ostrich are a family truth in the day of flightless birds. The two extinct species of ostrich are the common ostrich and the Somali ostrich. 
both in the genus Struthio, which is also which also contains several species known from Hellocene fossils, such as the Asian ostrich. The common ostrich is the more sp widespread of the two living species and is the largest living bird species. Other ostriches are also among the largest bird species ever. Mm -hmm. Go to the next Nighthawks are medium-sized birds with long wings, short legs, and very short bills. They usually nest on the ground. They, flee they feed on flying insects. Mm -hmm. Did I get to the dog? I mean, you said dog, yeah. And the, and the little owl, owl, and the cormorant, and the great owl, mm -hmm. and the horned owl, and the pelican, and the carrion vulture, and the stork, and the heron after his kind, and the mm -hmm. hoopoe, and the bat. And the bat. The yes. common gull, or sea mule, is a medium-sized gull that breeds in the Paleoctic Pelea northern Europe and northwestern North America. Adult common gulls are 40 to 46 centimeters, 16 to 18 inches long, noticeably smaller than the herring gull, and slightly smaller than the ring Build gold. The most annoying species of bird that I've ever known. This guy right here, the sea, the seagull as we know him over right. here. If you go, if you ever been to Coney Island Beach, if you ever been to Rockaway Beach, if you ever been to out in, in Long Island and to the beaches in Long Island, do not leave your food laying <laughs> around. Don't leave no potato chips. Nothing. Don't leave, they will attack you. Just like the commercial. You ever seen the commercial? Where the seagulls come down and attack the people, and they, these guys are annoying. They come into, and this is also because the Belt Parkway is supposed to be all water. Mm. That's all landfill. So man has taken their habitat, and they've had to come inland and eat from the garbage, eat from the streets, eat whatever is there, and to, to, to keep going, to keep living. And sometimes they get caught in the street. Sometimes you see them splattered, car runs them over because they come down on the street trying to pick up a chicken bone or something, and they don't make it. Mm. You know, so these birds we're supposed to stay away from. Let's go. Hawks are a group of medium-sized diurnal birds of prey of the family Asapritidae. Hawks are widely distributed and very, very greatly in size. The subfamily Asapritidae includes goat, ghost, sharks, ghost hawks, Sparrow hawks, sharp spin hawks, and others. This subfamily are mainly woodland birds with long tails and high visual acuity. They hunt by dashing suddenly from a concealed perch. I seen them, listen, I seen hawks. I seen hawks, they'll sit on the light pole on the on on the highway, like by 95, and they'll just stand up there, and then you just see them. They don't even flap their wings, they just they swoop down. And they'll go into the water, like I said before. And they will snatch their prey and come out of that water. That's the hawk. I seen a hawk in, in um, Prospect Park. I have a video of it. I should have added it. He had the squirrel on the tree. I seen a hawk on Queens Boulevard. Jumped on top of a, a um, he jumped on top of a, of a, a pigeon. And I stood there and honked my horn like I felt pity for the pigeon. <laughs> bam, bam, bam. That hawk stood up like this, looked at me. You ain't going to do nothing. You scared if you do it. No. <laughs> Seeing hawks on rabbits. Mm. Grab rabbits. And they just, they got the talents on them. And that, that rabbit ain't, it's not going anywhere. Yeah, it's a wrap. Yeah, so hawks, hawks will go up to, if he's really, 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 really hungry, he will hunt a Canadian goose. That's the big goose that we see all the way, all over here, that brownish, black, white goose. He will hunt him if he's really, really hungry. I mean, that's a, a, a heck of a fight. But he gonna, if he got to eat, he's going to eat. Mm -hmm. You know, so hawks are, are vicious, vicious hunters. Let's go. Valacrocoricidae is a family of approximately 40 species of aquatic birds, commonly known as cormorants and shags. Several different classifications of the family have been proposed recently, and the number of genera is, dis is it's disputed. disputed. So the aquatic birds are out for us. Mm -hmm. Let us go. The great owl, or the great owl, see, God, the great gray owl, or great gray owl, Strix nebulosa, is a very large owl. Documented as the world's largest species of owl by length. So this guy right here, he's so vicious, 
that he'll go up in the eagle's nest mm. and eat their young. They have an ongoing battle. They eat, when the eagle sees him, the eagle wants to kill him. But he tries to eliminate the eagle's next generation. Wow. And these are two, between him and the eagle are the most ferocious, ferocious hunters that you will find in raptors or the bird family. Mm. Let us go. Swans are birds of the family. And it's today within the genus Cygnus. The swan's closest relatives include the geese and ducks. Swans are grouped with the closely related geese in the subfamily Anserinae, where they form the tribe Sijnini. So what, what we see in the Tanakh, I believe when we got to the end of the part with the birds, mm -hmm. it spoke about um, and the horned owl. Mm -hmm. Go back to that part in Verse the Verse 17. Uh -huh. And the little owl and the comrade and the great owl, and the horned owl and the pelican, uh -huh. and the carrion vulture and the stork, and the heron after its kind, and the hoopoe and the bat. And the bat. So I believe when it talks about the horned owl, they changed the word, and that's supposed to be the swan. Mm -hmm. The word that you're looking for is ten shemit in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. When that word was first, was first translated in the Septuagint, which is, the Septuagint is the book that was first translated from the original um, Hebrew into Greek, right? And all of these 70 elders that did this translation, when they translated it, they all agreed that the, what they put down here is, I believe, the horn um, owl is the, or the Tim Shemit was a swan. Mm. So we don't eat aquatic, wet feet birds. Right. So why is that so important? Because... The swan is a family to duck mm -hmm. and geese. Um, our European brothers, I would just leave it like that. Our European brothers, they like to eat duck. Yes. But duck is not part of our diet because it was forbidden by God. That's part of the European diet. This is part of the part of the, of the region that they come from where these type of birds, these aquatic birds are eating, eating. But we do not eat that. God told us not to eat that. He said we should make uh, a, a, a separation between the clean and the unclean. Right. Didn't we just read that? Yes, sir. So we cannot eat swan or ducks or geese. Let's go. Pelicans are a genus of large water birds that make up the family pelis in the day. They are characterized by a long beak and a large throat pouch used for catching prey and draining water from the scooped up contents before swallowing. You said, these guys in action are magnificent. When you see these guys in action, like I told you, when I go to Panama and that Pacific Ocean, they are king. Because mm. they see when, that water, when, the, when the tide comes back and all that fish is coming back, they just group around and you just see them diving into the water. Poof! And they come out. And they keep doing it. I don't, I, don't, I don't know how much fish they can eat, but they keep going down. Boop. Wow. Grabbing fish, swallowing. Poof. And it's a bunch of them. They just keep swallowing the fish. They swallow the fish whole. Mm. That guy right there. So he's, a, he's also a predator. Let's go. The turkey vulture received this common name from the resemblance of the adult's bald red head and its dark plumage to that of the male wild turkey. While the name vulture is derived from the Latin word vulturus, meaning terror, and is a reference to its feeding habits. So this is the confusion with some people say, oh, you can't eat turkey. turkey. Right. Two different species of animals. So like our sister, our sister said in Staten Island, she sees a lot of wild turkey. So you can see the similarities, but it's not quite the same bird. So the turkey vulture, he's called a turkey vulture because he looks like, like a wild turkey. Right. But not that he is part, yes, not that he's part of the turkey family. Right. Right? He just called that because of the appearance. But they're two different species of birds, and we're going to get to the species of bird that the turkey's from. This guy right here, he eats dead animals. Mm. Let's go. Storks are large, long leg, long neck, wading birds with long, stout bills. Mm -hmm. They belong to the family Sikinidae and make up the order Sikiniforms. Sikiniforms previously included a number of other families, such as Herons and Ibises, but those families have been moved to other orders. The Herons are long leg, freshwater, and coastal birds in the family Ardidae with 64 recognized species, species mm -hmm. some of which are referred to as egrets or bitterns rather than herons. Mm -hmm. 
Hoopos are colorful birds found across Africa, Asia, and Europe, notable for their distinctive crown of feathers. Three living and one extinct species are recognized, though for many years all were lumped as single species. Oopopo, oopopo, epops. Epops. All right. Bats are mammals or, or the order of Cyroptera, with their forelimbs adapted as wings. They are only mammals capable of true and sustained flight. Yes, flying mammals. Quail so is now, a collective name for several genera of mixed so now birds. It doesn't, it doesn't mention, a quail is not unclean. Now I'm giving you the animals that are clean for a seed. So we know quail is good for a seed because who gave us quail? God. He gave us quail. When we were in the wilderness for those 40 years, it said every morning he gave us manna, and in the evening he gave us quail. Mm -hmm. So we know that quail is a clean animal for us to eat. But let's see what else falls under the order of the quail family. Quail is a collective name for several genera of mid-sized birds, generally placing the order galliforms. Galliforms is an order of heavy-body ground-feeding birds that includes turkey, turkey, grouse, grouse, chicken, chicken, new world qu quail, quail, and old world qu quail, ptarmigan, partridge, pheasant, franklin, jungle fowl, and the crassidae. So all these animals fall under the same order, the same family. They're all clean for us to eat. Mm. We could even eat a pretty um, peacock. Mm. Eat that too. I don't know how many people would want to eat that because that's a pretty bird, but we could we could eat a peacock. So these are all the, and the reason why I'm, I'm, I mention these birds because these are birds we found in the Tanakh that people were eating. So therefore, we also have to know the birds that we could eat. Let's go. White doves, rock pigeons. So we know the rock pigeon. The rock Turtle pigeon dove. is the same, the guy that's out here terrorizing all of our vehicles. Yeah. <laughs> violating our vehicles. Violating. Turtle, Turtle doves. Okay. All right. Verse 20. And all turtle doves we offered. You know we offered turtle doves so, and pigeons. Let's go. Verse 20. All winged swarming things that go up upon all fours are a detestable thing unto you. Yet these may eat of all winged swarming things that go upon all fours which have jointed legs above their feet, wherein with no, wherewith to leap upon the earth. Even these of them ye may eat the locust after its kind, and the bull locust after its kind, and the cricket after its kind, and the grasshopper after its kind. But all wings swarming things which have four feet are a detestable thing unto you. Uh huh. So we can eat locusts, crickets, and grasshoppers. I haven't eaten any crickets, locusts, or grasshoppers. But any one of you that that would like to feel free to. They say it's a great source of protein. I don't think I'll never find out whether or not it's a great source of protein. So. But you're free to. <laughs> Let's go. Get to the ones with paws, and then that's the one for the one with paws. Okay. And by verse 24, and by these ye shall become unclean. Whosoever touches the carcass of them shall be unclean until the evening. Mm -hmm. And whosoever beareth aught of the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. Every beast which part of the hoof, but is not cloven footed, nor cheweth the, chew the cud, is unclean unto you. Everyone that toucheth them shall be unclean. So and when you touch a pig, it makes you unclean. When yeah. you touch a dead dog, dead cat, whatever, any one of these animals, they make you unclean. You're unclean until the evening. Let's go. And whatsoever goeth upon its paws, among all beasts that go on all fours, they are unclean unto you. Whoso toucheth their carcass shall be unclean until you the evening. You can have a dog as a pet while he's alive. You know, he, he doesn't make you unclean. But once he dies, he makes you unclean. That's why... Um, like when we, in our homes, we have to be careful because, you know, little rodents get in sometimes. You get little things crawling around. You got to constantly be cleaning up. If you don't like cleaning up, these things are going to come in. You got to clean up. You got to keep things clean because these things make you unclean. These things make spots unclean. These things make portions and places unclean. So we have to constantly keep doing things to keep improving the the, the well-being of our home so that we don't have these things crawling around and dying and making things unclean. They fall into, into your food and into all types of stuff, and they make stuff unclean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People know about that. You, if you lived long enough, you know about if you lived in projects and apartment buildings and stuff like that, these things crawl into your cereal box, into all that stuff. It happened. It happened. It happened. 
So maybe some of you never experienced it. But if you lived in certain situations, you would know. Maybe your house is just one of those immaculate ones. But sometimes it happened. So that's why it's, it's very important to keep things clean, to keep things up to par so that these things won't come crawling into your homes. And you keep them clean and you keep them away from your home because they make stuff unclean. Let us go. And he that beareth the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the even. And be they un are unclean unto you. They are unclean unto you. Let me go to the slide. So yes. Dogs, cats, and bears are some of the animals that you will find in the Chinese live market. Live market. Animals that are ready to be slaughtered in order to use their meat for food. Bear bile has been used in traditional Asian medicines for thousands of years. It contains high levels of ursodeoxycholic acid, also known to be useful for treating liver and, and gallbladder conditions. However, there are now many readily available herbal and synthetic alternatives with the same medicinal properties. There you go. So you go to China, good luck. <laughs> if you go in there and you go eat, good luck. Good luck. They even found, like right here in Brooklyn, they found restaurants with dead skin cats and stuff like that yep. because any little small piece of chunk of meat you don't know mm. they put some dye on it you don't know right. and you're eating you don't know everything tastes like chicken <laughs> how that tastes like it tastes like chicken so we have to be careful what what is it that we put into our stomachs let's go verse 29 and these are they which are unclean unto you among the swarm of things that swarm upon the earth, the weasel, and the mouse, and the great lizard after its kind, and the gecko, and the land crocodile, and the lizard, and the sand lizard, and the chameleon. These are they which are un unclean to you among all that swarm. Whosoever doth touch them when they are dead shall be unclean until the evening. Shall be unclean and until the evening. whatsoever any of them when they are dead doth fall, it shall be unclean. Uh -huh. Whether it be any vessel, or wood, or raiment, or skin, or sack, Whatsoever vessel it be, wherewith any work is done, it must be put into water, and it shall be unclean until the evening. Then shall it be clean. They were out in the wilderness. These things will crawl up in your bag, in your sack, in different places. And they were found dead there, and, and it would make the sack unclean, or the, whatever was in there would make it unclean. That's why I, I stress to you, keep your homes clean, so that these things won't crawl up in your homes. Because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for space. Right now in New York City, we're having a rat problem, an infestation of rats. Did you, did you get the memo? If you're a homeowner, they sent you a memo. They said, when you put out the garbage, make sure that if, the, if, the, if, the gar if you're just putting out a bag, you got to put it out after 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. If you're putting it in a trash bin, then you could put it out by 6 p.m. because they're trying to control the rodent problem. Mm -hmm. There's a rodent problem in New York City, whether we see it or not. They got, there's a bunch of rats running around. Mm -hmm. Let's go. And every earthen vessel wherein, in it, wherein to any of them falleth, whatsoever is in it shall be unclean, and it ye shall break. So an earthen vessel, because it has pores, it says whatever any one of these things fall, roach, Mouse, whatever, you break it because the earthen vessel has pores. And that stuff's going to seep in through the pores, so you break that. Let's go. All food therein which may be eaten, that on which water cometh shall be unclean. It shall be unclean, whatever food be on it. That's what I'm saying. You, We think that so-and-so, you pour out that box of cereal and that roach is in it. It's dead. You got to get rid of that box of cereal. Let us go. And all drink and every such vessel that may be drunk shall be unclean. Everything that should be drunk shall be unclean. Let's go. And everything whereupon any part of their carcasses fall if shall be unclean. Shall whether, be unclean. Whether oven or range for pots, it shall be And God told us make a difference between the clean and the what? The unclean. So that all these things that become unclean, we have to make them what? Clean, clean again. And the ones that can't be made clean, we have to get rid of. Like the earthen vessels. Let's go. They are unclean and shall be unclean unto you. Nevertheless, a fountain or cistern wherein is a gathering of water shall be clean. 
For he who touches their carcass shall be unclean. Uh -huh. And if all of their carcass fall upon any sow and seed which is to be sown, it is clean. So if you if they fall, if they you find a, a, a pig dead in a river, the river doesn't become unclean, but when you pull the pig out, you become unclean. Mm -hmm. If you find it in a lake, the lake doesn't become unclean. Just you you take the person who takes takes it out of there is what um is what becomes um unclean. Let us go. But if water be put upon the seed in order of their carcass for their own, it is unclean unto you. But if water be put on seed, so the dry seed, if that carcass of that animal falls on the dry seed, the, the seed is still good. But once water hits that seed, it begins to germinate, it begins to breed, and the pores open up. It said that seed becomes unclean. You got to get rid of it. Let's go. And if any beast of which he may eat die, he that touches the carcass thereof shall be unclean until the even. Right. Any beast that, that you may eat dies of itself. A cow, a deer, whoever eats that flesh becomes unclean until the evening. Let's go. And he that eateth of the carcass of it shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. Say, whoever eats the carcass of it shall wash his flesh and be unclean until the evening. Let's go. He also that beareth the carcass of it shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. Until the evening. Let's go. And every swarm of thing that swarmeth upon the earth is a detestable thing. Uh -huh. It shall not be eaten. Whatsoever goeth upon the belly and whatsoever goeth upon all fours, or whatsoever have many feet, even all swarming things that swarm upon the earth, them ye shall not eat, for they are detestable Snakes, things. Snakes, gators, crocodiles, um... Anything that swarms. All of those things are unclean unto us. People eat all these things. Let's go. Ye shall not make yourselves detestable with any swarming thing that swarmeth. Neither shall you make yourselves unclean with them, that you should be defiled thereby. For I am your holy, your God. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy. For I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any man of swarming thing that move upon the earth. For I am your holy that brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. To be your God. He shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Be holy, for I am holy. He keeps stressing that. Be separate. Be sanctified, for I am separate and sanctified. Let's go. This is the law of the beast and of the fowl and of every living creature that moveth in the waters and of every creature that swarmeth upon the earth to make a difference between the unclean and the clean and between the living thing that may be eaten and the living thing that may not be eaten. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All honor and glory to the most high God. Thanking the Most High God for life and for understanding of Torah. I pray that you all have gotten something out of this. And I pray that the Most High God will bless us all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This time I'll ask us please all to rise as we will close out. And I'll give glory to the Most High God for this day. This portion of the day. As I say these words, I pray that the Creator will look down upon each and every one of us and grant us a blessing. <clears throat>